Prepare to Die, words you normally associate with the Dark Souls video game series, but as the rulebook proudly exclaims, players have a 15% chance of success, so perhaps that should be better applied to this game. Welcome to the Battling Barrow, let's have a look at the classic game Dungeon Quest. So this is the box, what the uh, front looks like, really nice artwork, um, has from the makers of Talisman, um, we'll get back to that in a minute, later on, dare you face the dragon's challenge, and on the back is this ominous bit of text. The eerie ruins of Dragonfly Castle, the tallest sinister peak of Worms Crag were abandoned long ago. Memories of the foul deeds of the wizard to serve have faded like a half-remembered nightmare, but far beneath the castle's shattered stones lay these horrors still proud in gloomy dungeons, while terrifying shadows stir in the sleep. Yeah, that's kind of quite flavoursome, so we're gonna have a look in the box in a minute, but let's find out a bit about the game. Dragon Quest is a dungeon crawl board game first released in Sweden in 1985 as Drakborgen by Alga AB. The game was designed by Dan Glim and Jacob Bonds and had been in development since 1980. A direct translation of Drakborgen is Dragon Castle, which seems appropriate as the game sees up to four heroes enter a castle and make their way to the centre, in which lies a dragon that has made the castle its lair to steal some of its treasure and make it out again before nightfall when the dragon will wake up. When it was released, a copy was sent to Games Workshop with an English translation of the rules and it became a hit in the office. It wasn't long before Games Workshop was striking a deal to release an English version and in 1987 Dragon Quest was released. So let's take a look in the box. So now let's take a look at the box and the contents. Um, Lovely artwork, very reminiscent of sort of second edition talisman, as is the back of the box. Um, get a nice little picture of what it looks like. Uh, it's number of players one to four, so you can solo this. There has slightly different rules for the solo, but nothing too major. It's mainly just the combat. Whereas combat in multiplayer uses this section here and tokens. In single player, you're just going to roll a dice and look up some results. Um, yeah. 12 to adult, playing time an hour, if yeah, if you last that long. I've had a game where it was the first turn, I died. Uh, game designers Dan Glim and Jacob Bonds, box art Peter Jones, made in England. So it's all the standard stuff here. Not too sure you really want to see this. Uh, what you want to see is inside the box. Nothing on the insides. Um, the uh, outside though, before we get going, has it's quite interesting. It has the Talisman 2nd Edition here. Blood Royale, Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader, the Warhammer Fancy Roleplay. Um, basically, all there. I've doing little advertisements for them for all their games. Blood Bowl, uh, Block Mania, I don't remember that one, The Fury of Dracula, and Chainsaw Warrior. Kind of when Games Workshop used to be more than just 40k and Age of Sigma. So in the box we have the rules. These are really straightforward rules and I really like the fact you can get into them really quickly. Um, most of the time, once you've got the basic rules down, you're going to be using this, which comes in sheet, which is a reference sheet. So if you get a bottomless pit tile, you're just going to look here to look it up. So you don't need to flip through this rule book. You're just going to be referring to this, which is just slightly uh, slimmed down but you also quickly know where you're going to look so if you get a card you're going to look at the card get a tile you look in this section like that idea where the rules are split out into two separate things gameplay rules and in-game sort of lookup rules so you're not flipping for a book surprise no one took that idea and has wrong with it further so the rule book is you're going to get your what your contents which you have a look at how to play the game it looks probably more complex than what it is. Here's to explain the combat, which I actually really like. <laughs> really like combat. Uh, you kind of have a combat card, and it'll have like an AI for what the monster's going to do. So sometimes you can prepare to fight it, and the monster just runs away, scared. Brilliant. I like that. So the uh, Hero Crest rules are just this. Basically, the combat's replaced by this. Roll with 12, D12, and see what happens. It's not, not the best, but quick and here we've got 
standard stuff we've just been talking about around the edge of the box. So that's the rule book, that's great. Uh, yours probably won't look like this, I always put mine in bags, so uh, let's have a look. Get some bits out. So here we have various tokens for the game. Have a look at, not, I won't get them all out because these are the drags. When you raid the dragon's treasure, you'll have a look. You'll get these out and shuffle them. And you'll pick one and sleep in, sleep in. These are the good ones. You'd never want to see that one. That means it's woken up and you're pretty much done in. Uh, you start the game with a magic ring. There's four different magic rings. So that's what this is. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and then these are the treasure tokens you're going to get. So you're going to pick these up. That one's worth, you, that one's worth a lot. Uh, 1800, so you want that one. This one's worth even more. Uh, it's 2200. This one's only worth 160. So that's the treasure tokens. Let's toss in there, get a load of those. Won't go through each of them. There's, there's so many. Uh, and we've got these, which are the combat tokens. I thought there's a set of three for each monster and player in the game. And what these are, these are, you have Slash, Mighty Blow, and Leap Aside. And there's one of these for each combatant in the game. Um, so you'd hand, if you're fighting a monster, you take yours, hand one of these off to another player. And then you pick your, what you're doing, Mighty Blow, it's basically like rock, paper, scissors. And then another player will pick one from here and try and work out what you think you're going to do you reveal them look up what the result would be and then deal with whatever that is normally monster losing you losing or both of you taking a hit or nothing happening at all so it's a bit like rock paper scissors and because there is a human making decision for the monsters it's a bit more a bit more tougher which is kind of cool i'll do like that solo play obviously you just revolt uh, replaces that with a dice roll. Here we have some dice in the game. It basically uses a d12 and a d6. Then you have some of these little cones which are used on the board to track things and on your cards to track your health. Uh, speaking of which, let's have a look at some of the cards now. These are the player cards. They're made out of thin, flimsy cards. If you got the hero, uh, Second edition talisman, you sort of know the quality of what these are. Not thick, chunky stuff. Our heroes are Sir Rohan, of a, he is a knight and have different characteristics of strength, agility, armor, and luck. Uh, so he has got quite a bit of strength, not much agility, lots of armor, no, not much luck. We have Vorlik the Breve, who's an adventurer, uh, low on strength on luck and agility next up you have el doran sure shot the ranger so low on strength high on luck and agility he also has an arrow track these show how many arrows he's got left in the game because he only starts with four so for a ranger you would thought you'd bring more arrows but ho hum and ulf grimhand the barbarian uh again the life track on all of them so that's what the uh they're used to track uh, in here we have a load of different cards so each time you reveal a room token you get you have a look at the room cards these are again fairly thin but not too offensive Townsman second edition and I have lovely uh, artwork on them so you have the goblin empty always want to see those Crips, giant spiders, cave ins, dead adventurer, torch goes out, empty dead adventurer, it's like repeating, curse the wizard, but I also have little random events in which I like. Um, crypts are interesting. When we get to a crypt, you draw another sort of card, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, Empire bats, damage d6 minus two. It's really cool. Just really nice little art here. Sneak attack, orc, which can be fighting an orc. Uh, just sim nice art. I generally like this style of art. This era of games from Games Workshop had sort of, to me, the best art 
best models as well really just generally like the aesthetics back then shuffle the deck yeah you got some treasure yeah so that's cool got those uh, let's take a look as we've seen the crypt cards at the uh, crypt cards themselves uh, so where are they? Uh, the nice thing about the rest of the cards is they they have sort of unique shapes. So you room cards are just normal shape cards. Crypt cards shaped like a coffin. Look at that. And what I'm going to be facing here is an empty crypt. Shuffle the deck. Trap. Lots of traps. Empty, empty, empty. And treasure. Traps. Treasure. Potion. Skeleton. And again, whenever you get these, it says see reference sheet, and that refers you to this reference sheet here so i then go to the uh crypt card section so if i get a skeleton for instance it has the rules here one to three nothing happens four to six skeleton springs to life so you know it's quick and easy look up and after a while you probably won't even be referring to the reference sheet um okay so if you come through a door on the tile which we'll look at in a minute you then have to go to the door cards, uh, open door cards, which are sh obviously shaped like a door, and these will be the door just opens. Cool, door is jammed shut. That means you have to try again next time. Uh, door's trapped, door opens, yada yada. So you got these, shuffle the deck, all pretty cool. If you encounter a dead adventurer, of course, you're going to pick up the corpse cards to have a look what happens. And these are obviously shaped a bit like a corpse with artwork on there. Uh, nothing happens. Look at that a corpse it's a potion nothing happens ah you find some rope in the corpse which looks like i don't know just worms rather than a rope flying out i love that shuffle the deck uh this corpse had a scorpion in it uh it's only the corpse never comes to life i don't think uh, just never comes to life as a zombie but oh hum that's the corpse cards traps if you encounter a trap card you just can go to this circular deck here and you get things like explosion, crossfire trap, cave in, more explosions, poisonous gases, and the like. No, hey, poisonous snakes. Why does it have to be snakes? And then finally, if you search a room, you're going to go to the uh, search deck and we have a little look at the searchings. So you might find things like a secret door, handy to escape through. There might be nothing, might be a potion, might have to shuffle the deck, might be treasure, or giant centipedes. Yeah, searching can be bad for your health. But not that bad, trap. Most of the time it's going to be somewhat beneficial or nothing happening to you. Okay, the monster cards are used in combat, so um, you decide what you're going to do. So you've got a choice of you can attack, wait and see what happens, or try and escape, depending on what you pick. You'll see what monster you're fighting is listed here and then what it's going to do. So in this case here, let's say I chose to attack and I'm facing the goblin. The goblin's going to run away. If I waited and see what happened, the goblin would still run away. But if I try and escape, the goblin would uh, slash me and then try and attack me. So that's what these are and they're all different. And so what it means is you had sort of an AI system going on, which kind of really cool. Solo, you don't get that with because you just dice rolled in, but with other players, that's really cool. Um, let's have a look at all these tiles here. I'm not going to show you every single one, we'll just have a look at a handful. These are the dungeon tiles that you uh, that stack up, and then each time you move into a new room, you pick one. So, this is a normal tile, it has a yellow arrow. Uh, this is a black arrow, so it means it's portcullis. So as you can see here, it means the way behind you locks shut. Um, yellow, arrow, uh, yellow arrow here is a corridor, which means you're going to quickly move through and pick another tile, which is great. That will get you through the dungeon quickly. Um, this is an orange arrow, which means there's a uh, pitfall in it, as you can see by the art. So yeah, they have different arrows that just designate what's going to happen. So blue, that means this is going to spin round. And they're all pretty cool. They all get the job done. They're not particularly majorly detailed, but as I said, they get the job done. They represent the room. You can quickly see what's going on. There's a T junction with a wheelbarrow and a pickaxe in. Uh, Portcullis, little skull in. It's simple, evocative, 
non-cluttered and because it's hand drawn it doesn't suffer from too much repeating going on as what modern games seem to suffer from when they're 3D done on computers and stuff. Have a look at the board. The board's interesting because it's like the second edition talisman where it's a bit of a jigsaw puzzle that you slot together. This is handy. It's uh, three bits here. I don't think I'm going to have enough room to set it all up. Uh, no, it's going to look something like that when it's on. And so these are your empty tiles and then in time you end up with tiles placed on and a little maze going through the dungeon which is cool and finally the models this is what the plastic looks like so we have we have sir rohan our knight we have our ranger we have our barbarian and our adventurer in sturdy blue plastic i like this really cool plastic uh, prone to snapping due to it being brittle, but I like prefer that to the bendy modern stuff that you get in games uh, Just like that So that's uh, what's inside the box. Let's uh, crack on and have a look at how to play The game could be described as a roguelike dungeon crawler each time you enter the castle the layout is going to be different the players start in the lower corner of the board, and when they move onto a blank square, they draw a tile to see which room they are in. Most tiles are normal tiles, in which case, once played, a room card is drawn to see what is in this room. Some tiles, however, are special tiles which have their own rules. Once all players have had a turn, the sunset track is increased. When it reaches the skull, nightfall has arrived and the dragon wakes up. All heroes still inside the castle are killed and the players controlling them lose the game. The aim of the game is to make it to the centre of the board, steal as much treasure as possible and make it out without waking the dragon. There is a risk to taking the treasure from the horde as each time a player does this the chance of the dragon waking up increases. So do you just take one piece and leave or do you stay and take more and increasing the risk of dying? The winner of the game is the player that makes it out of the castle with the most treasure. So let's now talk about the different versions and expansions for the game. There's the original Swedish Drakborgen uh, version which released in 1985, which in 1987 got an expansion called Drakborgen 2. This was split up the Games Workshop for the English releases as Heroes for Dungeon Crest in 1987 and Dungeon Crest Catacombs in 1988. Heroes for Dungeon Quest added 12 new heroes for the game, each with their own stats and mechanics and a few more cards and tokens for the game. Dungeon Quest Catacombs added more rooms, monster cards, encounters and objects. There was also the ability to travel underneath the main game board, which was added to the game. On 2010 at Gen Con, Fantasy Flight Games revealed they would be producing a new version of the game. Then, on the 11th of April 2014, Fantasy Flight Games announced on their website they would be releasing a revised edition of Dungeon Quest, with combat harkening back to how it was originally. So, I've not played the 2010 version, so I can only assume they would tweaked the combat rules a bit and it wasn't to people's likings. A Kickstarter was funded last year, uh, to bring back the original Drakborgen version and was apparently the most successful Swedish Kickstarter of all time. So I'm going to leave a uh, link to that in the description if you want to take a check it out. Okay, so guessing the game. Uh, both the Games Workshop version and the Fantasy Flight ver uh, version are long out of print, so you have to turn to the second-hand markets to track down the copy, is what I did to get mine. Um, Drakborgen is still available and hopefully someone will release a version of, hopefully someone will release a version of Dungeon Quest again soon. Okay, let's get back to this, the makers of Talisman. I remember seeing this game in the shops at the time and thinking it was part of the Talisman universe, but it's not. This is a bit of a lie. Um, it's if it's said from the publishers of Talisman, that would be more apt. Because all it means is that our beloved Games Workshop released a product. Uh, but they didn't make it, did they? It was released, as we saw earlier on, it's released by a uh, Swedish group first. So it's not really from the makers of Talisman. Although that is strictly true because Games Workshop did make 
talisman, but it is misleading in my eyes. It's meant to make you think that this is part of the talisman world. Uh, even the artwork is evocative of that. Uh, but it's a small thing. Doesn't matter at the end of the day, does it? Um, this is still a really cool game, and hopefully we'll get a, a gameplay session on the channel. But that is it for this retrospective, guys. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. Until the next video, please take care.